Hey, it's Tom here and welcome back to the channel. This video is going to be a simple guide on stock market multiples. Things that you may have heard of like the PE ratio or the price to book ratio or many of the other ratios and metrics that exist out there in the stock market investing world. This is going to be a video going through my top three uh, simple, easy to use metrics that are really useful to quickly screen out businesses that may look really cheap or really expensive just by some surface level numbers. Now, none of these metrics really replace a full intrinsic value calculation and I have several videos on the channel on how to do that if you're interested in checking those out uh, but these are very useful in order to screen different types of businesses some of these metrics work really well with certain types of companies and not so well with other types of companies so this video is going to be a simple how-to on how to use some of these key metrics in your own stock market investing now before we get into that we do have a sponsor for today's video and today's sponsor is Hatch. Now uh, I just actually checked through my email history and I've been a customer personally of Hatch for coming up about two years now. In about a week's time I will have been a customer of Hatch for two years uh, and I was paying for that service with my own money uh, out of my own pocket from well before they were a sponsor of this channel. Uh, and basically what Hatch does is they allow you as a New Zealander to buy shares in the US much cheaper than many of the alternatives like some of the big banks that offer overseas brokerage. Now, uh, initially when I switched across, it really was just fees that uh, sort of got me converted to Hatch. Uh, I was paying 90 US dollars a trade with one of the big banks. I can now do that same trade for three US dollars in Hatch. But one of the things that they've also done throughout these two years is continue to improve the platform. One of the things that they've launched just this month in March 2021 is kids accounts. You can now set up an account for your kids, buy shares for very, very low fees as little as 50 cents per trade uh, hold on to those stocks for an extended period of time and have no other fees throughout that entire holding period and really get compounding working for your children uh, and get it kind of started up early we all know that the earlier you can start that compounding growth uh, the better off you're going to be out the other side so if you're interested in checking out what hatch are doing or having a look at their kids accounts you will need to go to the link hatch.as forward slash investing with tom if you head to that link and create a new hatch account and deposit 100 New Zealand dollars into that account you'll get a free $20 top up from Hatch so that you can get started investing with a little bit more money okay so the first metric we're going to talk about today for simple stock market valuations is the PE ratio now uh, this is by far and away the most commonly used metric to get a simple feel for how expensive or how cheap a stock might be compared to its current earnings and that's the key thing to keep in mind with pretty much all of these metrics is that they are really looking at the performance of the business today businesses are not steady state entities they tend to either grow over time or shrink over time uh, and the PE ratio and some of the other ratios that we're going to talk about in a sec don't really encompass that growth or that decline in certain businesses over time but they do allow us to get a simple feel for uh, what sort of price people are paying for the performance of the business as it stands today now the PE ratio uh, basically has two components the P and the E and those stand for the price and the earnings and basically to calculate the PE ratio for a company uh, you can take the price let's say that that is $100 a share. You can then take the earnings, let's say that's $10 a share. Uh, if you divide the price in this case of 100 by the earnings of 10, you get a PE ratio of 10. And basically the higher that that multiple is, the more that people are paying for the current earnings of the business. So let's say that that business, the same business again, which is earning $10 per share, is trading at $300 a share. You can take the price of 300, divide it by 10, and you get a PE ratio of 30. So long story short, the higher the PE ratio is, the more that people are paying for the current earnings of the business. And the PE ratio is very widely used. If you look up pretty much any stock, uh, almost on any sort of platform, whether that be just a simple Google search of a particular stock, or whether you look a business up on something like Yahoo Finance or MSN Money or whichever other service you might be using, uh, you can pretty much always get a PE ratio for that business as one of the first stats that's presented to you. Now, there are a couple of situations where you actually won't see a PE ratio. Certainly the most common is if the business doesn't have any earnings or if they are losing money. So if you see a business with no PE ratio listed, that probably means that the business isn't earning money. If you have uh, negative earnings, it's very hard to calculate a PE ratio. The other thing you might see is maybe a negative of PE basically means the same thing the business is not earning money 
Now again, something like a P-E ratio does not completely replace an overall intrinsic value calculation. Uh, something that has a high P-E ratio may be expensive compared to today's earnings, but that business may be set up to grow very fast out into the future, and it can very quickly grow into that P-E ratio. But if you have a stock that is trading at a very low P-E ratio, it may not exactly be cheap either, because that business may have declining earnings over time, which if the price stays steady and the earnings are going down that means the PE ratio will actually go up over time which is sort of the reverse of what might happen with a growing company. So in terms of how I use this personally there are basically two main things that are really I'm screening out. So I'm not typically using a PE ratio to say yes I'm going to invest in this company. It's usually the reverse. It's usually a quick way of eliminating businesses and saying that I'm really not interested at them um, at this price. It's really not worth me doing any more digging into this company because it's unlikely that I'm going to be able to get my head around the valuation or it's unlikely that I'm going to be able to get behind with any degree of confidence some of the growth expectations that might be built into a particular company. So the first number that might come up in a PE ratio that will have me pretty much completely ignoring that business and moving on to something else is if it has no PE ratio or if the PE ratio is negative. Either that company is not earning money or it's losing money and then reporting a negative PE ratio. That is pretty much always an instant pass for me. Uh, I'm generally looking at profitable, profitable businesses and businesses that are reasonably predictable over time as well. So if I see a business that has no PE ratio or a negative PE, uh, it's something that's quite an easy pass for me. The other thing that's also quite an easy pass for me is if the business has some sort of extremely high PE ratio. And there's no real set figure that I use on this, but if we're talking probably 50, 60 times earnings, a, a PE of 50 or 60 or higher, uh, perhaps even 40, that's probably a business that I'm going to pass on. Unless it's a company that I'm very familiar with and I'm confident and grow very, very fast for that valuation to make sense, uh, it's probably a business where I'm just gonna move on and look at something that that uh, I can be more confident in that it's going to grow at good rates and still be available at an attractive price today. The next metric we're going to talk about is the price to book ratio and the price to book ratio is again a fairly easy to get kind of metric for most companies. If you look up a business on something like Yahoo Finance, search the stock ticker and look up some key statistics, you'll pretty much always see a price to book ratio and this is one of those metrics that is really really useful for some businesses and not so useful for other businesses. So uh, let's first describe what the price to book ratio is. Uh, again just like the PE ratio we have a price factor and we're dividing that by some other number in this case book value now book value is simply the assets of the company minus any of the liabilities so uh, if the business owns a bunch of buildings and a bunch of intellectual property for example those are all assets if they have some long-term debt then that would be a liability so you take the assets you take away the debt uh, and the kind of net amount that equity that you are left with is what's called book value in accounting terms so when you look at a price to book ratio if you see a price to book ratio of less than one you're basically seeing a business that is trading for less than that book value uh, you can buy it for half of sort of the net worth of that company for example if the book value was 0.5 or if the book value was something like three for example you're paying many multiples of sort of the net worth that is built into the balance sheet of that company now, like I said earlier, there are some businesses where the price to book ratio is really useful and other businesses where the price to book ratio is really a complete waste of time. And it basically comes down to looking at how that particular company earns money. Now, if the business is in some sort of industry where the amount of assets that that company has basically directly controls the amount of income and earnings that that business generates, that's a situation where the price to book ratio can be quite useful. So a classic example here is something like a real estate business. Now, a real estate business's income is basically entirely driven by how much real estate the company has. There's really no way that a real estate company can go ahead and earn uh, a really dramatically higher amount of income without increasing the asset value in its portfolio, increasing the book value in that company. So things like real estate companies, things like farms, uh, things like banks or insurance companies, those are all industries where the assets of the company hugely dictate the amount of money that those businesses can earn. 
And for that reason, the price to book ratio is a metric that's really useful when you're analyzing those companies, at least on a surface level, uh, before you do a deep dive into some of those companies. So if you come across a real estate company, for example, or a bank or an insurance company, and you see that the price to book ratio is well below one, it's trading at far less than the book value or the uh, equity value of that company, then that is something that may be of more interest to you and something that is potentially undervalued. But there are a wide range of businesses where the amount of assets that they have does not necessarily dictate how profitable those companies are going to be. And these are companies that can quite rationally be priced at many multiples of their book value. So uh, a company like Apple, for example, comes to mind. Uh, Apple can uh, increase their profitability by selling new services or increasing the price of their iPhones or selling more iPhone units, uh, really without spending a whole bunch of money on creating new assets. So Apple, uh, Coca-Cola, uh, Microsoft, any business that really is brand heavy and produces a large amount of money on a relatively small asset base, those are the types of businesses where the price to book ratio is really not particularly useful uh, as the business's profitability is really not dictated by the amount of assets that are sort of on that company's balance sheet. In terms of how I use this metric personally, basically if it's one of these businesses that produces a lot of profit on a relatively small asset base and it's really not the asset size that dictates their profitability, that's the type of business where I will just completely ignore the price to book ratio. But if it's a business where the the assets are sort of the main driver of how profitable that company becomes over time, uh, then that is a situation where I will be far more interested in the price to book ratio. And really what I'm looking for is if it's in and around one or especially if it's below one, uh, that is a situation again where it's not necessarily guaranteed to be undervalued. But it's a situation where I'm able to say that this business could potentially be undervalued, it's possibly trading below intrinsic value, and it certainly warrants more digging from me as an investor. Now the third and final metric that we're going to talk about in this video is EV to EBIT, which is sometimes referred to as the acquirer's multiple because of this book, The Acquirer's Multiple, where they talk about EV EBIT. And um, basically, uh, really interestingly, if you had simply just bought the lowest EV EBIT stocks uh, in the stock market consistently over a long period of time, you actually would have produced a 17.5% compounded return from 1973 through to 2017, compared to about 10.2% on the S&P 500. And that was basically the topic of uh, this book by Tobias Carlyle, The Acquirer's Multiple. But that book is where I really learned a lot about this particular metric, EV to EBIT, and it is essentially a highly improved PE ratio. It's a slightly more intelligent PE ratio that factors in a few other things. Now, the acquirer's multiple, as the name might suggest, was basically born out of people looking at a simple metric to see which businesses were potentially cheap or expensive to acquire entirely, to buy out the whole business. And basically, uh, there again are two components, the EV, which stands for enterprise value, and the EBIT, which is earnings before interest and tax. Now, uh, let's touch on the EV part first. Uh, just like the PE ratio, this is basically a way of describing the current price of the company, but it is a little more intelligent than something like uh, just a share price or a market cap, which the PE ratio tends to use. The reason it's a bit more intelligent is because the enterprise value uh, includes factors that the market cap or the simple share price does not. And the real key things there are basically any debt or any cash that the business has. So it's start, starting to incorporate some balance sheet stats. And it also incorporates any preferred shares or minority interests in the business. So, so let's say you're looking at a company that currently has a market cap of say a billion dollars. Uh, let's say that it also has 200 million in cash and no debt that would mean that the enterprise value of that company is only $800 million. So although the price or the market cap on the surface of things looks like a billion, uh, when you buy that company, you're actually also getting access to that 200 million in cash. So the effective purchase price or the enterprise value in this case is actually only $800 million. So for that reason, companies that may look cheaper on a EV to EBIT basis are really companies that are probably tend to have a cash rich balance sheet with very little debt. Now the other part of this equation, which is EBIT, which stands for earnings before interest and tax, uh, is basically another way of comparing the profitability of any particular company. Now, uh, something like the earnings, which is used in a PE ratio can be very useful. 
Now EBIT in some ways can be uh, more useful in certain situations and again this sort of comes back to an acquirer looking to buy out an entire business. Now some of the things that can influence earnings, uh, not EBIT but just plain old earnings, are interest and tax and that's the reason why these things get added back and basically they are generally influenced by things like how much debt that particular company has. So if we add back the interest payment and we add back the tax, uh, we basically basically have a way of comparing the profitability of different businesses regardless of how well financed they are. So regardless of whether they have no debt or a little bit of debt or a moderate amount of debt or a lot of debt, uh, we can compare companies on sort of an equal basis so that if an acquirer were to go into that company and just buy out the whole thing and pay off all the debts and you know pocket the cash or whatever it might be, uh, all businesses are on an even playing field if we use EBIT as opposed to earnings. Now I would be remiss not to say that if you go too far down this track of modifying earnings and using things like EBITDA especially uh, our boy Charlie Munger back here will start to uh, call that out as bullshit profit because that is taking away some very real costs through depreciation especially uh, but EBIT is a very useful metric like I say to compare the profitability of different companies uh, regardless of their financing structure and again just like a PE ratio the higher that number the higher the price people are paying for the current earnings of that business or the current EBIT of that business and the lower the number the lower the price that people are paying for the current EBIT of that business but we're also in this case factoring in some of the balance sheet stats so if you have two businesses that have the same EBIT and the same market cap for example uh, you will tend to see a lower EV EBIT if the company has more cash and less debt and you'll see a higher EV EBIT if they have more debt and less cash. So uh, it incorporates some of those balance sheet numbers and it's a really useful way to incorporate that overall sort of financial statement analysis into a simple, easy to use metric. So there you have it. Those are the three metrics that I probably use most commonly as a initial screen to get a feel for whether a business might be cheap or expensive. Uh, the PE ratio, the price to book ratio, and the acquirer's multiple EV to EBIT. Uh, again, none of those metrics on their own replace a full discounted cash flow or intrinsic value calculation, but they are a great starting point to very quickly screen out businesses that are just gonna be way too expensive or find businesses that might be worth uh, further investigation and doing a bit more digging. So I do hope you enjoyed that video and learned something from it. If you're interested in the Hatch offer, you'll need to go to the link hatch.as forward slash investing with Tom. But that's it from me today. If you did enjoy the video, please hit like and hit subscribe and I will see you in the next one. Cheers.